Masking is probably the single most important concept in mixing music. That one loud sound can make another quiet sound hard or even impossible to hear is something you'll be well familiar with, both from everyday life and maybe also from your producing experience. This doesn't just happen with broadband sounds like white noise. Even single resonant peaks can make other pitches quite hard or impossible to hear. The theory of masking describes many different ways in which sounds can get in each other's way. And we can learn a lot about how we can prevent this in our mixes. Let's start this discussion of masking with a few audio demos. I'll be using very simple sounds like sine waves and noise for these, but I think you will already be able to see how this translates to a mixing scenario. Later on we'll get to more practical examples of how you can use this information in your DAW. Our simplest example of masking is just a tone that's being masked by white noise. I'll be playing with the tone, then gradually increase the level of the white noise till it's fully masked. Then I'll turn off the noise so just the tone is left. During all this the tone will stay at a constant and volume, but you'll be able to hear it disappear and then appear again. Most elements in a mix won't be full spectrum white noise, but they can still mask each other. In this next demo I'll filter the white noise down to a narrow band and then play a sine wave close to the band, then fade the noise in and out again. The sine wave will constantly remain at the same volume. Next, what I'll do is move the sine wave up and down in frequency. I want you to pay attention to what happens to it as it approaches and then leaves the frequency area of the masker. Thankfully for us music producers, this narrow band masker is only able to mask frequencies close to it. As listeners, we have the ability to focus on certain frequency areas and follow what happens in them, regardless of what's happening in other frequencies. So your symbols are at no risk of masking your sub bass. These frequency areas we are able to focus in on are called critical bands. If two sounds fall within a single critical band, they are at risk of masking each other. To get a sense for how wide these bands are, I've got another listening exercise. I'll be masking a single tone with pink noise, but use a notch filter to remove the noise from around that tone. Notice that once the noise is removed at a certain distance from the tone, it will no longer fall in the same critical band as the sign. As we make the notch narrower again, you will be able to hear the noise slowly falling into the critical band of a test tone, making it harder and harder to hear, until it becomes completely inaudible, even when it's still clearly separately visible on the spectrum analyzer. This is how we are able to deduce the extent of these critical bands. These auditory filters are about a third of an octave wide, while slightly widening in the bass range. Another way to visualize this is to draw a kind of acoustic shadow from the masker. Everything that falls under this shadow will now be masked. Notice that the quieter the mask tone is in relation to the masker, the more likely it is to be masked even at a greater distance. Interestingly and somewhat frustratingly, this acoustic shadow is not linear. The louder the masker, the more high frequencies it will hide in its shadow. This is known as the upward spread of masking. While the filter stays roughly linear for frequencies below the masker, frequencies above it will be affected disproportionately more. I suspect this upward spread of masking is what is responsible for the lower mids being such a notorious problem area in mixing. As gain increases they will mask more of the frequencies above them. It might be why we call them by the unflattering name mud. If they get too loud they'll get in the way of the instruments in higher frequency regions, making the whole mix sound muddy. A clear takeaway from this should be that it's important to check your mixes at different playback volumes, even on the same speakers. Remember, what is still audible at a lower volume can become masked as you crank the gain. You probably don't want a mix that stops sounding good once you play it loud.
Now, how can we make sure to prevent masking in our music so that every element stays clearly audible? The first and most powerful technique for this has nothing to do with mixing. It's all about arrangement, songwriting and sound design. If you want two elements in your tune to be clearly audible, don't place them in the same frequency area. If they fall in the same critical band, they will be fighting each other. But once they sit in different places in the spectrum, they can't get in each other's ways anymore. So if you have two melodic instruments in your song, shifting one of them one or two octaves up or down might save you a lot of headaches later when trying to mix them. And if you plan on having a vocal front and center, don't clutter the vocal range with other instruments, they'll just be fighting the vocal. Now let's say that's not an option, you've done your best in arranging but you will still like to gain a little extra clarity in your mix. Just using EQ we can do quite a bit to pull a sound back out of the acoustic shadow of another one. In this next demo I play you the white noise versus test tone demo again. And at the start the tone will clearly be masked, but instead of turning it up or the entire noise down, I will simply use an EQ to dip the frequencies around the test tone in the noise and suddenly it will become audible again. Think of it as making room specifically in the critical band of a test tone. This same principle can be applied to mixing. If a background element is clashing with another one in the foreground, turn down the frequencies of said element that sit in the same range as the foreground element. Notice that this requires a deliberate choice which part is more important to hear in which frequency area. The background element being pushed out the way will end up in the masking shadow of the foreground element and you need to be okay with that. This can go as far as permanently assigning a certain frequency range to one or two elements. A popular technique in some genres is to cut the low frequencies from every element except for the sub bass and kick drum to only have to deal with those two in that range. The subs of every other instrument are considered of lesser importance and simply discarded. This kind of drastic decision using high and low cut filters to completely remove certain ranges from a mix element may not be appropriate for every genre and song, but it is a good principle to be aware of, especially considering that critical bands widen in the bass range. This unmasking with EQ technique is the backbone of most mixes, but it does come with one problem. An element may not stay in one band. Instruments play different notes or don't play for a while and we may not want to permanently push back everything else even when the foreground instrument isn't even playing in that area. To address this a newer unmasking technique has emerged in recent years using a sidechain dynamic EQ, multiband compressors or some kind of spectral filtering like Sooth, TBT, Speccraft, Track Spacer, you name it. To make things clear and non-distracting, I'll demo this with a simple piano melody on a white noise background. The piano will be moving around a pitch and also rest at times. It's set as a sidechain input of my spectral unmasker, which will selectively duck the frequencies of the noise whenever the piano is playing there. I'll start with the unmasking turned off and then enable it and you'll be able to hear how the piano is lifted out of obscurity. You may think that this sounds quite weird and unnatural on the noise, but this is largely because we are expected to fill the entire spectrum. With a more tonal element like this pad it will sound a lot less weird. Thank you. 
to say in this particular case I'd also recommend just turning the piano up but I tried to keep my audio demos quite extreme so the effects are always clearly audible and obvious. Another actually simpler dynamic unmasking technique is broadband sidechain or ducking. This is useful for unmasking when we have two full spectrum elements fighting for space in a mix. In my case I've got a snare that contains pretty much all the frequencies from 200 hertz upwards and my instrument bus that also occupies a broad frequency range. The sidechain will duck away the instrument bus as the snare hits, making it much more clearly audible. Like everything, masking can of course also be used as a creative effect. In my song Rats, Bats and Critters I mixed the vocal deliberately quiet and quite a noisy beat because I wanted it to be difficult to hear and fade in and out of audibility. It's meant to be a quiet muttering in the distance and not at all a lead instrument. <laughs> But unless this is the effect you're going for, be careful which element you let interfere with which frequency range. On a little side note, masking is also a concept heavily used in psychoacoustic file size compression techniques like MP3. The goal here is not to fix the masking, but to instead use the theory of masking to find information in a mastered audio file that is less important and not audible anyways, to then be able to throw it out and thus reduce your file size significantly. The rough idea is to analyze your sound spectrum, draw on the threshold of hearing we know from the Fletcher Munson curves, throw away all the data below it and then draw all the masking shadows and throw out all the information covered by them too. Using the plugin AP Unmask, we can actually listen to the stuff a psychoacoustic compression algorithm would consider masked and not worth preserving. Let's listen to what those sound like on my song Wandering. I'll play the normal audio first and then the stuff that's masked. I'll boost it a bit because it's relatively quiet. If we face cancel this masked information from the original audio, you'll notice that we hardly miss it. Now there is a whole other side to masking beside frequency masking, a kind of masking where the masker and the masked sound don't even have to happen at the same time. Temporal masking is the phenomenon of sounds casting an acoustic shadow throughout time, even after they stop. As an example I will play a quiet sound that you should clearly be able to hear. Then I will play the same sound again, but preceded by a much louder sound. And even though the two do not overlap in time, the quiet sound will become masked. Where it gets really strange is that this can also occur backwards in time. The time period is a lot shorter, but if a short quiet sound that would otherwise be audible is immediately followed by a much louder sound, we cannot hear the quiet sound, even though the two sounds do not overlap. The following louder sound almost makes us forget we heard a quiet us one millisecond ago. Quite interesting. Here's the same audio demo, but with a masker happening after our masked sound. In mixing, this kind of masking is most likely to happen to percussion and transients. Longer sustained sounds will probably ring out for long enough to escape the acoustic shadow of the masker, even if the part immediately following the masker could get masked. This is one of the reasons you might want to use look ahead in your sidechain compression. Let's return to our snare example. By adding a bit of look ahead to the sidechain, we can further unmask the transient and make it sound a lot more snappy. This 
can also matter for other sounds. For instance, on the piano sample earlier, I had to use a fair bit of look ahead to properly unmask it. For this whole video, I've made one big simplification. With all prior examples, I pretended that all our mixes will be in mono. That's of course not true. In reality, we work in stereo most of the time. So let's explore how that can affect things. The following audio demos will be most clear on headphones. They might also work on stereo speakers, but they'll be useless on laptop or phone speakers. Much like how we are able to focus on critical bands and pick the band of the element we want to pay attention to, we can also direct our attention to one ear or the other. This allows us to choose the ear with a better signal to noise ratio, not just for hard pan sounds, but also for slightly panned elements. You can see that in this case the right ear in blue has a better signal to noise ratio for our own, so we can pay attention to the right and hear it more clearly. Another less expected binaural masking effect is that we can also unmask the sign by slightly delaying the test tone on one side. As long as your noise is mono, this binaural offset can also help make the sign easier to hear. Unmasking by binaural phase shift sadly does not work nearly as well with stereo noise. Relying on these techniques to create clarity in your mix is not without danger, since they are of varying effectivity on different playback systems. As mentioned, they will have the greatest effect on headphones, less of an effect on stereo speakers and for mono playback systems like some phones or laptops, they will be useless. How much you want to make use of them ultimately depends on which audience you prefer to cater to. They're certainly a useful toolkit to further enhance your mixes after you've cleaned up your frequency spectrum. That's it for now. In the next part of the series I want to further explore the stereo space we've just briefly visited. Episode 3 will be all about our spatial perception, the ways in which we can tell where a sound is coming from and how we can use this to create width depth and immersion in our mix. If you want to learn more in the meantime and support this project, consider becoming a channel member for bonus lessons or even several full courses on subjects like sound design, bitwig, drum production and the grid. I also offer private lessons if you're looking for feedback on a song, help understanding a technical matter, sound design, composition, a creative block, bitwig, anything really. I'll try my best to help you take the next step in your production journey. All links and further resources are in the pinned comment. Cheers!